A new coalition of left-leaning groups called Just Majority is pushing to expand the U.S. Supreme Court. And this week, they kicked off a national tour right here in Boston with help from some of the biggest names in Massachusetts politics. Our goal to the Supreme Court is simple. Get your house in order or Congress will do it for you. We are building a nationwide movement to ensure there is a majority on the Supreme Court that stands up for equal justice. I don't want to mess with the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court is messing with our democracy. The court is meant to ensure equal justice under the law, but in its current configuration, the highest court repeatedly overturns the will of the majority of the people. And they behave as if the rules don't apply to them. But even if you accept that diagnosis, and an increasing number of Americans do, is expanding the court really the best solution? For that matter, how likely is it that public pressure will push lawmakers or the court itself to change the status quo? Joining me to discuss are Renee Landers, a professor of law at Suffolk University, past president of the Boston Bar Association, and a former deputy assistant attorney general in the Clinton administration. I'm also joined by Paul Collins, a professor of legal studies and political science, at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you both for being here. Renee, this group, Just Majority, mentions recent decisions as something that they find extremely troubling when it comes to the court, but they also highlight recent revelations about Justice Clarence Thomas. He has, as you know, and many of our viewers will know, apparently been the beneficiary of largesse from Harlan Crow, a conservative mega donor for a couple decades, and has not disclosed that fact on financial disclosures. And he also didn't recuse himself from cases involving the 2020 election, even as his wife Ginny was actively working to overturn the results of the election. How troubling do you find Justice Thomas's conduct in these two cases. So I think Justice Thomas is kind of the canary in the coal mine on this entire issue of the ethics of the Supreme Court. The real problem is that the Supreme Court has, is not bound by any um, rules of ethics that would regulate their disclosures, regulate their, dis their um, recusal uh, requirements, and also um, uh, provide a mechanism for um, the public to have insight into how they make these decisions about recusal. So I think the real problem is, you know, yes, these are all very troubling revelations about him, but I, I'm sure you could find something on uh, uh, several of the justices, um, you know, failure to report or, you know, uh, taking money from someone that doesn't seem quite right. But I do think that uh, that the real problem is that they need to adhere, uh, you know, adopt an ethics code or I think the Congress will do it for them. Paul, do you agree with Renee's assessment when it comes to what Justice Thomas did or did not do? Is the big problem at this points up the fact that there's not a rigorous ethics code for the court? I completely agree. So part of the issue with the Supreme Court, as Professor Lander said, is that the court doesn't have an ethics code. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about what Congress will have to do in order to get the court to have an ethics code. This is to say that it's not evident to me that Congress could pass an ethics code and say, okay, here it is, you have to follow this. I think Congress essentially has to get the court to do it. And to do that, they probably have to play some hardball. The, the court seems very reluctant to adopt an ethics code on its own. What would playing hardball look like if they cannot, in fact, pass an ethics code for the court? How might they push the court to take that step? I think Congress, its big power is its power of the purse. Congress sets the court's budget. Now, Congress has to pay Supreme Court justices. That's in the Constitution. But Congress can use some creative ways to constrain the court through the budgetary process. For example, not funding the court the way it's currently being funded. I think that's Congress's big mechanism. Uh, I want to talk about the decisions that the court has issued recently, which have been pretty prominent, because that's another piece of this push that Just Majority has launched and bigger public backlash to the court. But before we get into those decisions, I want to look at some data that Pew has put together when it comes to how Americans feel about the court, how they felt about the court over the last three and a half decades. First off, the favorable numbers for the court have dropped really sharply since the mid to late 80s. Back then, 76% of Americans had a favorable 
assessment of the court's performance. Uh, now it's down to 49 percent. And there's a big partisan drop that is fueling that. And that's the way Democrats feel about the court. You look back in the, again, mid to late 80s, about the same number of Republicans, even more Republicans than Democrats, thought highly of the court. 80 percent for Republicans, 75 percent for Democrats. Now it's down to just 28 percent of Democrats who feel like the court is doing its job well. Renee Landers, um, one point that Ayanna Presley brought up is the idea that the court's recent decisions are out of step with where the American public stands on issues like abortion rights, gun control, civil rights, other things. Is she correct in that assessment? Well, I think she is correct, but I, I hesitate to make that the total metric of the acceptability of court decisions, because if you look back to the 1950s and 60s, the court's decisions in Brown versus Board of Education, Loving versus Virginia, which is the interracial, the case saying uh, that laws against interracial marriage uh, were unconstitutional. Those cases were very unpopular also at the time that they were decided. So I don't think that's the total measure, but what is wrong with the recent decisions of the case, the Bruin case on um, uh, the Second Amendment and the Dobbs decision on uh, the constitution, uh, the uh, you know the constitutionality of access to abortion, is that those decisions really changed over long-standing ways of looking at those contra uh, constitutional provisions, and they are actually. Um, you know, first of all, in the abortion case, they're disrupting what I, Roe was a compromise, and it was working okay, and they're disrupting that balance. And then in the case of uh, the Second Amendment, and, and also the abortion cases, they're using this history and traditions test to look at the validity of current law, regulatory laws, and that's inherently uh, uh, reactionary and backward looking and that's really what the problem is it's not the decisions themselves just inside I want to make sure that I understand that the Bruin ruling the gun control ruling correctly what the court says tell me if I've got this okay, this sure. right is that when regulations are passed involving guns gun ownership the focus needs to be as you said on tradition whether those regulations comport with tradition historically speaking as opposed to any public health benefit correct right? correct and in fact in the majority opinion in, in justice thomas's decision in that case they they kind of openly mocked the dissenters for referencing the statistics on gun violence and all that sort of thing that perhaps were motivating some of the restrictions and i you know i think that's very problematic if you're not looking at what the impact impact of the legal rule is on society today. Paul Collins, given the problems that we've been talking about here when it comes to the court's decisions, lack of disclosure, lack of recusal, public opinion, to the extent that that is important, do you think that expanding the court would be productive if, in fact, there was some mechanism for expanding it? Or do you think that the advocates who are pushing that are barking up the wrong tree? I appreciate where the advocates are coming from. Uh, it's an interesting way to address the current issues facing the Supreme Court. I personally don't think it's a very wise move. I, I think what it would be get is a tit for tat strategy. That if you increase the size of the Supreme Court today to add four justices, it becomes a seven to six liberal to conservative court. The next time around, what's going to happen is it's going to be increased again. So I think that there needs to be other solutions that are seriously talked about in terms of how to address the problems facing the Supreme Court. What might well, some of those solutions be, to your mind? I think that the best solution that would help address, although it would take a while, the current problems taking, facing the Supreme Court would be to institute 18-year term limits. Um, this would provide a variety of benefits. One thing it would do is kind of take the heat off the Supreme Court appointment and confirmation process. Today, it seems like every time a seat opens up on the Supreme Court, the sky has fallen. We get into these bitter partisan battles. If you had staggered 18-year terms, a president would get a selection every two years. It would also serve the function of connecting justices closer to the American public, which would address some of the concerns with these wildly out of step rulings involving issues like gun rights and abortion rights. Uh, Renee, how do you feel about the idea of court expansion? Um, I, I, I kind of agree with um, Professor Collins because I think that um, 
Yeah, it will result in this tit for tat kind of situation. Um, another uh, solution, in addition to the 18 year terms, uh, that's been proposed would be, you know, to get rid of this idea of, you know, the Supreme Court justices being, you know, their own kind of thing and status, and perhaps considering having a rotating pan rotating panels, you know, randomly selected perhaps. Uh, but some method, meth mechanism of selection of a court of appeals judges who would serve a few years on the Supreme Court and then go back mm. to being appeals court judges. So again, trying to take all the, you know, a lot of the political heat and valence out of the Supreme Court selection process. As we talk about these prospective reforms, I'd love to get each of your takes on whether public adv advocacy of the sort that we saw on display in Boston this week, whether that is in any way helpful comes to pushing these reforms. Uh, Paul, let's start with you and then we'll go to Renee. Is, does, that, does that help the case, make the case for reform to have people calling out the court publicly in the way they're doing right now? I like the idea of talking about the Supreme Court in this way in a public forum. Uh, frankly, I think the Supreme Court has, has kind of become such an elite institution that we need to take it down a peg. Um, we elevate judges in this country, and this is particularly true with respect to the Supreme Court. And so, for example, if you take the proposal of having the Supreme Court be a rotating panel of courts of appeals judges, that's a really interesting proposition because it would take some of the elitism out of the Supreme Court. One of the things that doesn't sit right with me, and it's really at the heart of a lot of what we're talking about with the Supreme Court, is this idea that the Supreme Court is above everything else. It's above a code of conduct, for example. Um, this is very problematic, and I think it would be a healthier discussion to, to take the court down a peg, to talk about them, about what they fundamentally are, which are civil servants, um, and to have this discussion in public, I do think is useful. Renee, do you agree with Paul? Yeah. I totally agree. And I think it was really profoundly disappointing to see Chief Justice Roberts's response to the um, request that he appear before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, I think that uh, it was completely tone deaf to the political mood in a lot of the country that is um, not really impressed with some of the actions of the court recently. And I think that um, it does smack of this elitism that they somehow, we, we should trust their judgment about these ethical rules. Every state Supreme Court in the United States is bound by a, a, set, a code of judicial conduct that they adhere to. And in fact, you know, there is a disciplinary process that applies to all of them. They do not operate with that level of arrogance about their role in the judicial system. Uh, I want to make sure I'm remembering this correctly and refreshing the memories of any viewers who might need a refresher, as I do. Uh, Justice Roberts said that it would raise separation of powers concerns, right, if he were to go before Congress? Is, or am I getting that wrong? Uh, no, that's what he said, and I, I totally disagree with that. I think it's to it it'd be one thing if Congress were asking him to come and justify the decisions of the court. That would be wrong, and that would intrude on the judicial role. But asking him to come and testify about applications of ethical rules, just like the budget, as Professor Collins referred to, is not problematic, and I don't think it raises any separation of powers concerns whatsoever. I want to ask a closing philosophical question of each of you. Paul, you can go first, and then we'll hear from you, Renee. But part of the uh, criticism that this group, Just Majority, is making is that the court is now too powerful and too political. I'm wondering if there was ever a time when that was not the case, or if, in fact, we've just had our eyes opened to that inherent politicalness and power in a way that we haven't before. So, Paul, what's your take on that? The current Supreme Court is probably the most ideological Supreme Court in American history. So the court has always been a partisan institution. It was effectively designed to be a partisan institution in terms of the way we pick Supreme Court justices. But what's happened, uh, and this is very recent, is that we can basically sort Supreme Court justices by their partisanship. Um, and it, because of this, it looks overly partisan. In terms of power, it is making radically fast decisions. So we're used to seeing changes made in the judiciary occur over the course of decades. And what we're seeing today are these very, very swift, very, very significant changes, again, in areas like abortion and gun rights, that it's almost impossible to attribute to anything but a change in the makeup of the composition of the court itself.
I think that gets to the point that you made earlier, right? That there's a, a disruptiveness, structural disruptiveness to the decisions the court is making right now? Yes, I agree with that. And, uh, you know, just going back to your question historically, you know, the country started out the very, you know, the iconic Supreme Court decision, Marbury versus Madison, about where the Supreme Court, you know, gave itself this power of judicial review. Um, operated out of a controversy over appointments of judges. So this has been going on since the beginning of the Republic. So the con you know that sort of aspect of things is not new, but I do agree with Professor Collins that the um, you know that the rapid uh, fluctuations in doctrine is really what has caused the concern right now. All right, Renee Landers, Paul Collins, thank you both for this. Appreciate it.